This morning as I awakened here at the hotel, one of the first things that I did was to go to the door and look in the corridor for the morning newspaper because this hotel makes a practice of complimentary newspapers in the morning. And there wasn't a newspaper there. And I felt this immediate sense of frustration. Some people can't get started in the morning without a cup of coffee. I want to have the newspaper because I am a addicted to that most ancient of addictions, the hunger and thirst for something new. Remember the philosophers that gathered on Mars Hill and uh, we read in the Acts that uh, all they busied themselves with every day was discussing what was new. And yet we know that there's nothing more boring than yesterday's newspaper. I had an interesting experience just this week. Somebody who's in this room tonight, in fact, was given as a present the entire New York Times, the authentic New York Times that was printed on the day of his birth, which was in January of 1953. And he let me read that edition of the New York Times, which was, what, 33 plus years old. And it was unbelievable to read what was on the front page and on the sports pages and all that sort of thing. The, the, the names were different and the faces were different. John Foster Dulles' picture was on the front page and there were allusions to Truman and to Eisenhower and, and that sort of thing. But what was the news about? Trouble in South Africa? Trouble at getting along with the Soviet Union? And on the sports page, believe it or not, the lead story was on the brand new antitrust suit that had just been filed against the National Football League because of television rights and that sort of thing. I think we've just gone through now endlessly here in, uh, in our own uh, time period. And as we read these things, my friend said, he said, look at this, there's nothing new under the sun. And he quoted from the book of Ecclesiastes. Well, that gets us to chapter 1, verse 4, where we read this uh, <clears throat> statement. One generation passes away, and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. The sun also rises, and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose. The wind goes toward the south and turns around again to the north, and the wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. All of the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing nor the ear filled with hearing. That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And here's the refrain. And there is nothing new under the sun. Now we're still seeing the elaboration of this ancient form of skepticism and of pessimism. One of the most common images of skepticism in the ancient world was found in the image of the circle. We find it not only here and in Egyptian pessimism, but we particularly find it in ancient versions of Greek skepticism, which have been most formative in the development of Western civilization, where the Greek skeptics developed what they called the cyclical view of history, which means simply that history has no definite point of beginning and no definite point of termination, but it simply goes around and around and around and around in an endless repetition, in a meaningless 
circle, a vicious circle of insignificance. That's what was understood by the cyclical view of history. Again, Friedrich Nietzsche, in the 19th century, when he set forth his philosophy of despair called nihilism, spoke about the myth of the eternal return, in which he, he called attention to the same idea of the circle. And he said there are two images from the ancient world fighting for men's intellectual allegiance. There is the image of Apollo, the god of classical Greek beauty, the god of order and form and harmony, of rationality, of teleology that is of purpose which characterized the high age of Greek culture. But he said competing all of the time with Apollos was the figure of Dionysius. We remember Dionysius who was connected with Bacchus, the god of, of the wine. Dionysius was the one who was the god of irrationality, of chaos. The father of the so-called Bacchanalia, or the Dionysian frenzy, where people would seek to escape the controls of rationality and just react and respond, letting it all hang out to the meaninglessness of this world. And Nietzsche said, we must side now with Dionysius. See, again, using the image of the circle. There's a very famous book in American literature that borrows its title from this portion of the book of Ecclesiastes. One generation passes away, another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. Verse 5, the sun also rises. And the sun goes down. Who wrote, The Sun Also Rises? One of the great apostles of despair and of the meaninglessness of human existence in the 20th century was Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway was ultimately a pessimist, saying that ultimately death wins. And the only way we can have any kind of victory over death is for us to decide to determine the time, the place, and the means of our own death. We cheat death only by suicide. And Hemingway was utterly consistent with that, being an expert hunter, expert marksman, kissed his wife goodnight one night and went down to the kitchen. He took out his favorite honey rice, carefully adjusted the scope and all of that, knew exactly where the instant kill point was in his own body, set up the rifle with the hair trigger and so on, and then proceeded to blow his own brains out. That's his final comment. The sun rises and the sun sets. The sun rises, the sun sets. Do you see it? The endless circle. I think one of the, the most vivid and poignant uh, demonstrations of this was in the film, it's se several years ago now, uh, in which uh, Jane Fonda starred, called They Shoot Horses, Don't They? Remember that film? Which is, takes place during the Depression, where as a matter of entertainment and also as a matter of a way to get some uh, money to put bread and butter on the table, that one of the rages or fads of the era was the marathon dance. People would enter in the marathon dances that would last for hours and days, and the last couple standing on the floor would win the prize, do you remember? And so this film is all about one of these marathon dances. But one of the most significant points of the movie takes place when they're trying to eliminate 
uh, more and more people every hour instead of just the normal slow pace of dancing they would have a, a double time promenade around the perimeter of the dance hall where the master of ceremonies would pick up you know, the, the beat and make people move to the beat of the music going round and around the dance hall and he would stand there at the microphone and say Huzza, 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 round and round and round we go. And where we stop, nobody knows. And he just kept accelerating the beat and making these people move round and round. One guy has a heart attack and dies. But you go through the emotional experience of these people who are trying to endure, trying to win the marathon. But all they do is get more exhausted, more discouraged, until finally, one by one, they surrender to the experience of endless repetition. The sound and the fury that signifies nothing. And they quit. That's the image of the cycle. You see it throughout history. Again, here in Egypt, there in Israel, then in Greek, now with Nietzsche, 20th century existentialist, still talking about the endless repetition, nothing new under the sun. In contrast to that view of history, the image of the cyclical view of history is the Hebrew view of history, which is linear. The very first statement recorded in the Old Testament stands over against this view of life and this view of history with the words, in the beginning, God. The whole concept of creation is on a collision course with nihilism because the concept of creation in Israel makes this affirmation that this world and that human life had a starting point not in chaos, not as a cosmic accident, but from a purposeful act of a transcendent, eternal God who starts something that is new. He creates it. He sustains it. And he remains in a position of lordship over the movement of history as all of history is moving toward an appointed destiny, just as you in your personal history are moving toward an appointed destiny. More about that as we go later on to the book when we see an exposition from the coalesce, from the preacher's perspective of the meaning of time. We'll look at that further uh, in a few moments. But this, but this concept of creation that has a definite starting point, do you see, is on a completely different view and level than what we find in the image of the circle. That's what it's all about. The whole battle between Christianity and secular humanism is between this, the circle and the line. Back in the 50s, uh, Edward J. Carnell, out of Fuller Seminary, wrote a book in which he said, modern man defines himself in these categories. That man is conceived now as a grown-up germ who is sitting on one will, one cog of one wheel of a vast cosmic machine that is destined for annihilation. I love it. A grown-up germ. A cosmic action. 
This is what drives me crazy. Uh, let me back up for a second. I am totally convinced of the either-or character of the, op of, of the opposing philosophical systems. We either embrace full-orbed theism, or you must, if you're thinking and consistent, embrace utter nihilism. Anything in between, I am absolutely convinced, is a total academic intellectual cop-out by people who want to have their cake and eat it too. Consider for a moment the utter folly of humanism. I talk about this every chance I get. Here's what I hear the humanist, the modern humanist, saying and teaching in our schools. He tells us on the one hand that man is a cosmic accident who's emerged from the slime with no intrinsic dignity, no eternal purpose, and he lives his life and is moving towards the abyss of annihilation so that the two poles of human existence, origin and destiny, are defined by the humanist in terms of radical insignificance. And yet, believe it or not, the humanist pleads for human rights and human dignity in between those two poles. They say, while man is alive, he's important, he's valuable, he's significant, he counts, we want to protect him, we want to value him, and all that. You talk about mythology. I'm saying if if the two poles of human existence are utterly meaningless, if my origin is insignificant and my destiny is insignificant, then have the guts of the nihilist to say my life is insignificant. Talk about blind faith. That's what humanism is. I have no respect for it whatsoever intellectually. I do take seriously the voice of the nihilist because he understands what's at stake here. If there is no God, then human life is a cruel joke. It is a tale told by an idiot. That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And the key verse here, and there is nothing new under the sun. I think that verse is not only important for understanding the cyclical view of history that portrays this spirit of skepticism that is the heart of the controversy here, but also I think is a clue to understanding the book. I mean, the Bible is not saying that the Word of God declares that everything is futile and everything is vain and that not, there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, the whole Bible is pointing towards the good news, something dramatically new, and it talks about newness of life and you can have a new life and all of that. How, so how can we reconcile those statements? The point here is the use of the phrase under the sun. Under the sun. Let me use this uh, circle again, move it down here, and make this the sun. And here we are. We live life under the sun. The Hebrew expression under the sun means from a perspective of this world only. Here's the ancient response to secularism. Secularism adopts as its fundamental philosophical idea this, that all of there is, is the saculum, this world, this time. There is nothing transcendent. There is nothing beyond the sun. Or if there is anything up there, we have no access to it. We cannot know anything about it. That man finds himself imprisoned in life, in the here, and in the now. That's the message of the secularist. 
There are no absolutes because there's no transcendent. There can't possibly be an absolute without a transcendent. All we have are preferences. So from the perspective of being time-bound and space-bound, if the only perspective you have is from this side of the sun, then the only conclusion you will ever arrive at if you're thinking is utter skepticism. That's why revelation is so important. That's why the Bible is saying that we get a message from the other side of the sun, from the one who makes the sun, from the one who stands above the sun, and who comes into this world to reveal the news that we are of eternal significance. But what the preacher is doing here is he's considering the other side. That perspective of life under the sun. In fact, if you consider life only from the perspective of this world and the, and the values of this world, you'll end in despair. I mean, have you ever raised the question, why am I doing this? I remember when I was six years old, I cut on early. We had, a, we had to walk to school, and, and the last quarter mile was in front of this great big church, and the church had had parking lot outside, and they had these great big telephone pole trees type logs that, that uh, were set there to keep the grass from falling out in the parking lot and to keep the cars from going into the grass. And so the trick was when you went to school is that you got on that log and you balanced all the way that quarter mile on that log, see? And you did that for enough time, enough days, you sort of get bored and you have to have something to think about. And I can remember walking down that log one day Ask myself, how come it is that I have to go to school five days out of the week so I can have one day to play? And then I have to go to church and do all that stuff. This seems like a rotten deal. <laughs> Six days out of seven, I had to do what I didn't want to do just so that I could have one day when I could play, which is what I thought was the meaning of life. I still struggle with that. I mean, it just doesn't seem right. This six days shalt thou labor and uh, be doing, doing through all this stuff. It doesn't make sense. I've spent most of my life doing what I'd rather not be doing. Why am I doing this? Have you ever asked yourself that question? If I didn't have the word of God, I'd be stark raving mad. Or else I'd just stop thinking. I wouldn't ask these questions anymore. But sooner or later, you have to ask those questions. Why am I doing this? Is there any purpose behind it? There is no. Is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new. It has already been in ancient times. Isn't it interesting that this ancient writer is talking about ancient times? <laughs> <laughs> he says, and there is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. I really saw something fascinating right here at Las Colinas Center uh, uh, be between yesterday afternoon and this morning. I walked into the pro shop, the golf course, yesterday morning, and standing at the counter talking to the pro, was Terry Bradshaw. And there were other people in the room who were paying attention to other things. And nobody was paying any attention to Terry Bradshaw. That was in the morning. At 3 o'clock, I walked past the pro shop. I didn't go in. And there was this mass of people rushing towards the pro shop. It looked like the uh, people fleeing out of a theater in the midst of a fire, only instead they were going into the pro shop. And I thought, what in the world's going on? And somebody said to me on their way in, Herschel Walker's in there. <laughs> Herschel Walker's played 
half a game in the NFL, and everybody can't wait to go in there and see Herschel Walker. Perry Bradshaw has four Super Bowl ring rings, and nobody could care about his being there. He's forgotten already. And that's what, that's what the author said. That's the way, like, how fleeting is fame and glory and success and triumph. There's no remembrance, nor will there be any remembrance of the things that are to come by those who will come after. I, the preacher, was king over Israel, and I set my heart to seek and search out wisdom concerning all that is done under heaven. This grievous task God has given to the sons of men by which they may be exercised. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed all is vanity and a grasping for the wind. A grasping for the wind. The beautiful imagery by which this sense of frustration and futility is communicated. You know, some of the most brilliant teachers in all of history have been uh, skeptics. I'm in awe of the insights of Jean-Paul Sartre and his ability to express these fears and feelings of pain that assault every one of us. But again, this is not the end of the matter. So don't you tune out. We're still considering the other viewpoint, the alternative to full-orbed theism that the preacher will set forth if we just have the patience. In fact, he'll begin to set forth a different perspective in the second chapter. And we'll take a look at that in our next session.